Good morning. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. In 1528, 11 years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to Wittenberg, Germany, a Scottish young man who was 24 years old had recently been saved by the recovery of this gospel. His name was Patrick Hamilton. He traveled to Germany then to sit under the expositional teaching of Martin Luther. And he was greatly deepened in his faith as he sat under the teaching of this man of God. Then Patrick made a daring decision to leave the safety of Germany and to go back to his homeland of Scotland, which would bring a certain death for the preaching of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. He went and he preached at St. Andrew's for six weeks, and he boldly proclaimed the truths that we have been studying for the last five weeks. He was arrested. He was confined to a dungeon, and then he was brought to trial, and he was charged with various heresies for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was condemned. On February 29, 1528, he was burned at the stake in St. Andrew's, Scotland, and as he was fastened to the stake and the flames were lit, those standing by heard him pray, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Becoming Scotland's first martyr to die for his testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, Hamilton influenced Scotland in a great way after his death. Eighteen years later, another Scotsman came under the power of the gospel, and he made his way to Germany as well. His name was George Wishart, and he too returned to Scotland to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to his kinsmen. And he too met the exact same death and he was burned at the same stake in the same town of St. Andrews, Scotland. And he came to the fire and he prayed similar. He said, Father of heaven, I commit my spirit into your holy hands. And to the people who watched, he said, for the word's sake, the true gospel given to me by the grace of God, I suffer this day by men. Not sorrowful, but with glad heart and kind. For this cause I was sent, that I should suffer this fire for Christ's sake. This grim fire I fear not. What would possess two young men to live and die in such an extraordinary way? What motivated them to preach the gospel in the face of such opposition and threat? What impacted them so deeply to hold fast to this gospel even in the flames? And the answer this morning is soli deo gloria. They lived and they died for the glory of God alone. They were more consumed with his glory than the flames that engulfed them in that fire. They saw something in this gospel that we have been studying that brought them to the highest point that any man can ever travel, to the Mount Everest of all things. There is no higher point anywhere in the universe. It is the glory of God. In fact, to live this life for any higher motivation than this, anything that goes higher than that is to miss what all of this life is. And the purpose for which this universe that Robin described was brought into being. This, my friends, is where all of the solas must lead. This is why this series is so important 500 years later. To rightly understand the four solas will bring you under soli deo gloria, to God be the glory alone. A man by the name of David Van Drunens wrote a book, and it said, Soli Deo Gloria is the glue that holds all the other solas in place, the center that draws the others into a grand, unified whole. While every good preacher who studies and labors under the word, he thinks his topic is probably the hinge pin. And in this case, all of the solas that have been preached, uh, they say this is the most important one. And that's good. But when you, you, when you look at these beauties, it, it just seems like that each one you study is the hinge that all the other ones turn on. But dare I say this morning that this is the solo that all the others four come to. The other four solas walk up this mountain to look out at this view that declares the glory of God alone, solely, alone. By holding forth soli deo gloria as the lifeblood of the solace, 
we remind ourselves that the biblical religion captured by the Reformation is not ultimately about ourselves. The highest purpose of the solas is for the glory of God. He magnifies himself through the abundant blessings that he bestows upon us. And so this morning we will come up and we will see that all of these uh, solas of our salvation are to lead us to the highest place where God gets all of the glory alone. And that's been my prayer all week, is that we would worship a God who is worthy of all glory and all of these things that we have studied are journeying to this one place. So let's go to God and ask that he would meet us in his word this morning. Father, 500 years later from that Reformation, we are trying to recover those and continue to hold and treasure and preach these beautiful truths of salvation. And God, our prayer is that you would get all the glory. When these are rightly understood, it is to God be the glory alone. And I pray that, that you would bring every heart to that place by the time we finish this morning. God, if there are any unbelievers that before they walk out of this place, they'll be worshiping the glory of God. Any believers who have drifted and wandered into making themselves the center of the universe, that you would grant a beautiful repentance and that all of us would worship you at the end of this service as the God who alone deserves all glory, praise, and honor. Amen. Well, as I've been praying about these solas in the Reformation, uh, I've been giving much thought to our day in light of it. Uh, it's always good to say, well, you know, what, what does our day look like? What, if I nailed up a 95 thesis today, what, what would I nail on it? What would I write on it? And just spending time examining my own heart, what, what do we need today? If, if we have some Martin Luthers in the house, and some of you, I think, could be, there's just some beautiful zeal and truth and knowledge and beholding the gospel that I love, um, what does the church need today? And, and it certainly needs scripture alone because we're moving into a day where your God speaks to you and, and you, you're, that's more sovereign and you get more from that than the word of God. There's arguments that it's not inerrant, it's not sufficient. Uh, we, we need to recover that this is the word of God, perfect, given by God, no mistakes, no errors to reveal himself. So we certainly need uh, a sola scriptura. We need grace alone. Our pride fights it. We fight a God who, who is the one who does it all. It's all him with zero man. And we, we need to recover the grace of God. And we need to recover faith alone because we hate bankruptcy. We hate weakness. We hate that I can't pull myself up by the bootstraps. And so the church of God needs a reformation to faith alone for this gospel. And we need it for Christ alone because we are told there are many ways to God. There's all the different religions pointing to the same place. Anyone who dies, no matter what they believed or lived, they're in a better place, and we have lost that it's Christ alone that can bring us into the very presence of God. So yes, we need a reformation today. <clears throat> but as I look at Southside Bible Church, which is a big concern to me because I love this church, I love its people, and I'm asking myself, what do we need Okay, I get the broad church, the universal church, but what does this local assembly need in light of all these truths? Sola Scriptura is, you guys believe this. If I don't handle this thing accurately, I get shaken right at the end of the service. That is not our problem. Our argument is, what hermeneutic do we use? How do we interpret a perfect word that has no error? That's the problem that goes on here. So I don't think we need Sola Scriptura at Southside. I don't think we need sola gratia. We get sovereign grace and that he's the giver and we're always going to be the receiver. Sola fide, not one stitch of our own merit can be added to Christ. I think the majority of us sit here knowing I can't add one, one bit of righteousness, not even one piece to this salvation. I get it. I know that it's through faith alone. And sola Christo uh, is, is the passion from the first week of this church that we proclaim him and keep lifting him up and look at him from every angle. Uh, we are lovers of Christ, and we see him alone 
as the way of salvation. Soli Deo Gloria. This is where I've been praying for our body. This is what happens when we really get. When Paul says, I pray that you're, you would get this in Ephesians, that you would understand it. Uh, that, that this is what happens when you really understand the solas, because we might just get them academically. We've got to make sure it's more than that. And here's the test of whether it's more than just academic. This is what takes over a heart when you understand the solas. Like, like the two men I started the sermon with who are ready to die for this gospel. This is what happens when the solos are rightly understood in our minds and in our hearts. I let goods and kindred go this mortal life also. That's what happens. But these solas can become so familiar. They can become almost heirloomish where I, I pull them out when, just when I want to look at them when it's 500-year reformations. Uh, it can become very academic where everything you've learned the last five weeks, you're saying, I knew that. I know that I've studied it for decades, and all it has become is an academic thing, and it hasn't led you to soli deo gloria. And they can just become taken for granted, and they can drift from our hearts, and we kind of get drowsy as we're waiting for eagerly for a Savior. We start putting our tent stakes down here. I heard a preacher say, we, we've quit preaching hell, and we've quit preaching heaven. All we want is here. Here and now, I just want my tent stakes down. I want God to give me the, my best life now. We mock the book and we live it. And so here it is, the battle. We get focused on the scene and the here and the now. And we start thinking, this is just all about me. It's all about my family, my kids, my job. This is all me, me, me. It's about my health, my plans, what I want to do. I can drift so far that my kids' sport will trump the glory of God in worshiping. We get more concerned about what we want out of life than the passion being our supreme one and all that we do being God. And so as I've been looking at my own heart and, and you, would God blow through here this morning and give us soli deo gloria in our hearts and fan that little faint flicker into an inferno so that we will make every sacrifice incumbent upon us to live exclusively for the honor and glory of God alone. Would God do that in our midst this morning? And so for that, I want to go to the throne of grace and ask that this church would have soli deo gloria from every one of its members. And I can't produce that, but God can, so let's ask him. Father, we come before you, and I don't want to understand these solas just with my head. God, I pray for everyone in this room that we have been laying hold of these. God, that these are every one of our testimonies. And they're not heirlooms and they're not cold to us. But these truths have made us alive to God. And Lord, you alone are now our passion. You are the center of all. You are the giver of all. We want to be alive to your glory alone. I don't want to give my life to make much of me. I don't want to spend my days with something so small as Ken Murphy. God, I pray every heart in here would just be eclipsed with your glory through these solas this morning. And that every knee would bow and say, sola deo gloria. I, I give you all the glory alone. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. God, would you do that? in our midst. Do what no man can do. Do that by your spirit, through your word. This morning we pray. Amen. It's bad for me to take a month off and then come and preach on this. So if I'm a little over the edge, forgive me. This has been bottled up for a month. Oh my goodness. Martin Luther, just a quick history and very quick history. He began his academic life, actually started out studying law because that was his father's desire. And he excelled in his studies. And then he had the death of some very close friends. And he became very troubled in soul over death and knowing he would die and he would meet God and he would have to give an account to this creator whom 
earlier, he had been hit by lightning and came very uh, face to face with the power of this God. And August 17th, 1505, he left the university and he entered into a monastery at the age of 21. Uh, he, had been, he had had an amazing glimpse of the righteousness of God, which I think we need recovered in our day and age, where it's so glorious and beautiful uh, that we, we can't attain to it instead of we can pull ourselves up to it. He, he sought then to be saved, and he started trying to, to live a righteousness that could measure up to this glorious righteousness of God. And he began, he fasted more than any others. He prayed, he did penance. He would do hours of confession while he lived in a monastery. And you're like, what kind of trouble do you get into in a monastery? And his conscience was so guilty and undone before God that it said the other uh, priests would get tired of hearing his confessions. And it just, it was a man who was struck with who God was and who he was, and he just couldn't get rid of the guilt and he kept confessing, but he found no peace. And his question was, is how can I stand before God's holiness with works that are as polluted as mine? How can I get into that presence? I have to perish. I must perish. He saw God's perfect righteousness. He demanded it from all of his beings because he's righteous and God has to require that. But Martin Luther did not have it, and the more he tried, the more elusive it was. And there might be some of you this morning who are doing that same thing. And the more I try to get it, the more further away it's getting from me. That was the spiral that Luther was in. And he hated God then for making the standard of righteousness so impossible. I'm supposed to love him, but he's given me an impossible standard, and he grew in bitterness toward God. Here's a direct quote from him. I had no love for that holy and just God who punishes sinners. I was filled with secret anger against him. Love God, I hate him. And in Romans 1.17, it brought a hatred for God to his heart. And the theme of Romans, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, <clears throat> for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in this gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And that verse made Luther hate God because he's demanding a righteousness and I can't get there. Well, one day Martin Luther was studying and he's wrestling with that verse. He's wrestling with that phrase, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And, and the, the of God, he realizes, is a subjective genitive. And that just simply means that the noun in the genitive of God is what produces the action. So a better translation would be a God kind of righteousness is revealed in the gospel. So God requires a God kind of righteousness, a divine righteousness, a perfect righteousness. So in the gospel, this God kind of righteousness uh, is given to you by faith. And can you imagine the sickness the mental illness of what was going on in Luther and what he could not find and what was destroying him. And finally he realized the righteousness that he had been trying to attain was a gift that God would give to you by faith apart from works. Luther was altogether born again. And he finally realized it's a gift from God. He'll actually give me the righteousness that I've been longing for and trying to get. And he said this, at last by the mercy of God, Meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context and the words, namely, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. And therefore, and there I began to understand the righteousness of God is the righteousness with which God, the merciful God, justifies us. He de declares us not guilty by faith. And here I felt that I was altogether born again, and it entered into paradise itself through its open gates. The Reformation gave birth from that. That is when, when you finally lay hold of that, that will be sola deo gloria. And so sprang the Reformation, and nothing could stop it. What that man had found in the gospel of Jesus Christ now would spark and spread to the entire world. And so I thought we would conclude this morning then in Romans where the whole Reformation began. That is where it began. 
And I believe in the book of Romans, the five solas come forth from it. And my desire today is to open up, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 11, uh, I would like to open up verse 36 by proclaiming soli Deo Gloria to you. And I'm just going to read verses 33 through 36. <clears throat> oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be the glory forever. Amen. That isn't written in a, just kind of a blank place. That is a 11 chapters that I need to set the context. So uh, we're going to have a meal afterwards, so I feel the freedom to go a little late. So let's, uh, let's work through the context just a little bit. The, the theme of Romans is I'm not ashamed of this gospel. It's the dunamis of God. It is the power of God to take sinners and bring them into the realm of salvation. And so that's the whole theme of Romans. And he starts the gospel now. And where we start today with the gospel is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That isn't, that isn't at all where Paul began. He, he actually began this in verse 18. Now here's the gospel. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. So Paul's going to begin with the bad news. He's going to start with the reality. The wrath of God is upon you, sinner. So what is the importance of the solas? Well, the solas answer man's greatest need is man needs salvation. The five solas, if you'll notice, they're all prepositional phrases. And, I, and you don't need a lot of English or grammar to understand a prepositional phrase has to modify something, doesn't it? And so we have to ask ourselves, what are they modifying? What are these pointing to? Well, they're pointing to justification by faith in Christ alone. How to get into a right standing with God. How to be saved from the wrath. And so this whole series is because we are born with the guilt of Adam. Adam sinned and took us all with him. We are born with corruption now, with self as a center reference point, and everything that we do, we are locked in and bound to self. And we are separated from God, and we have no key to open the door to get back with him. Romans 1.18, we are under his wrath. God is angry against sin. His justice demands punishment. We are dead spiritually. You're a corpse and you can do nothing to fix your problem then. We need a perfect righteousness to be in his presence. And so we need a reformation. We need a gospel because you're lost, dead, and separate. We need help. We need soterion. We need salvation. And listen to this. It has to be outside ourselves. Guys, we were stuck with no remedy, no fix. And if we don't get help outside of ourselves, we're going to perish. And the solas are about help that came from without, and it came from God himself. We need God, who has within him an attribute that we call grace. It is a God who is gracious, and he's a God who desires to save sinners. And we need a wisdom beyond ourselves. We need a plan to deliver us from the predicament of eternal wrath. We need something that we can bank our lives and our eternity on. I, I don't need a good idea. I'm sick of good ideas all over Facebook. I, I don't want a blind faith. I need something bedrock if I'm going to entrust something this significant to. My eternal well-being or my eternal destruction, eternal, forever. I don't want an opinion. I don't want to know what you think is a good idea. I don't care about what I think. That don't mean squat to me. I need the word of God. I need God to give me in his writing the promise that I can bank my life on from God. Praise God for sola scriptura. This is the revelation of God. He has put it down so we can bank everything on this. I don't have to doubt it. I don't have to wonder. I can die on this gospel because God gave it to us in a secured, perfect, inerrant word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And pastors 
two favorite words in Scripture are in Romans 3.21, but now. But now, as we are dead and we are lost and there's no help, but now God has done something. This is what the solos are about. God did something for our condition. And it says, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. There's another way to get righteousness apart from the, the law. And the prophets and the scriptures and everything has been pointing to this person. There's another way to get right with God apart from you getting better and cleaning yourself up. And that, that's the best news you could ever hear for a depraved, ruined sinner. But now, but now, God has acted in grace. And grace is God not giving us what we deserve, but the opposite. We deserved wrath. And he gave us something that isn't even right, fair. So quit crying for justice. <laughs> Be amazed at mercy and grace. God did something for us. He will accomplish and he will bring about our salvation from beginning to end. What a God, sola gratia. Our God is gracious. And my question then, God, is how are you going to do this? I see a gracious God. How, how are you going to do it? And the answer is Christ alone. Christ alone. God would enter into this world and he would take on a flesh and Jesus would represent us. I'm not thirsty. I was meeting with some sweet twins that are going to get baptized. They're so cute. I, I love them. And they got these amazing testimonies of salvation. <clears throat> and I pulled out the old cups and did this old illustration. So I never do illustrations. It's the last one you're ever going to see from this pulpit while I'm here at least. But it's, I, I, we just got to get the gospel. Um, this is Adam. Adam, born in the world. He's a representative head. And he represents all of humanity. He's the only one who was born perfect besides Jesus. And so he's born without sin. And he represents mankind. And the enemy comes and deceives him, tricks him and Eve. And they, they sin and they take all of us with them. And this says you. So that means you. Okay. You were in Adam, it says. So what Adam did, he represented you. And when he sinned, we went with him. When he fell and he was separated from God and now the wrath of God was upon him, that's us. We were in Adam. And so the reality of the fall hit every one of us. And then God comes and this is what grace is. This is, says Jesus. God sent his son into the world and he came and he lived that perfect righteousness that God demanded. He did everything. He loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself. And then there's one other thing, is our sin deserves justice and wrath, and it must be punished. And so God takes his own son, puts him up on a cross, and pours out his full wrath upon him for every sin that we've ever committed. He becomes guilty of every one of them. And he's punished, and he's put in a grave. And on the third day, he rises again. And now he's seated at the right hand of God. And, and by faith, not your works, just you're in Adam. He takes you now and he puts you in Christ. And so what God sees now when he looks at you is Christ. He sees the perfect righteousness that he requires. He sees his justice satisfied on his son. And Ephesians 2 says, you are now seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Our position right now is we're seated in heaven in Christ. That, I'm going to throw these away, sorry. The little kids loved it. Where are the little kids? Wasn't that cool? It's beautiful. That is the gospel. That is Romans and what it taught and so, guys, what a God who will treat you as if you live the life Jesus lived and you died the death that he deserved. And now, by faith, he'll bring you into peace with God in a relationship. And so my question is, then, how do I get this? Jesus did it all. How do I get this? I would walk a million miles if he asked me to do it. You just tell me, God, I'll do anything. And that's sola fide. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And for this reason, in Romans 4.16, it's by faith that it might be in accordance with grace in order that the promise may be certain to all of his descendants. 
And so, guys, there's a way for us to have full assurance. One of the, one of the main Catholic leaders of the day with the Reformation said well, his problem is that the Reformation is giving people full assurance. And their whole theology was is that you don't know if your good deeds outweigh your bad, so you can never have assurance. And what Romans 4 says there is you can be certain because it, it's by grace. He did it all. So what, what works with grace? Can it be grace and say, now you got to go do 10 things to get it? It just blows the whole thing up. So the only thing that could ever work with the grace of God is an empty hand that receives it. And so the only thing that will ever bring about the salvation is I have nothing, I bring nothing. God has done it all in Christ Jesus. I believe. Faith. And you're justified through it. Cert- I want you to be certain. Quit looking at yourself and look at Christ alone. It's almost like elevated to doubt your salvation. And that's going back before the Reformation. I want you to look at Christ alone for your assurance. I want you to gaze that he has done it all and he's been raised to declare to you this is acceptable. Look at him. The soul that gets this is all together born again like Martin Luther was that day and it becomes heaven on earth. And there's nothing greater that I possess than peace with God. I love it. Peace with God. Well, Romans goes on to show you, and I need to go on, that this gospel gives you spiritual life now. You are joined to Jesus, and your life is hid with him, and you are made alive to him. And in that relationship now, God will sanctify you by his Holy Spirit. And he will start growing and changing you from one image of glory to the next. Every testimony of a believer must say, I'm not what I should be. I'm not what I could be. I'm not what I ought to be. But because of Christ, I am not the same. And the grace of God is changing. Not to the degree I desire or want, but it is changing me. So you're not saved by works, but you're saved for works. God's mighty power and decree protects you. And brings you to heaven safely, and he declares you are so safe that there's nothing, there's no power that can separate you from this God. And in Romans 8, Paul cries out, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. I'm just going to, if I forgot something, anything that's been created, I'm just going to throw it out there. Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He'll never lose you. I, I love that. I want you to live in a confidence of this beautiful, powerful salvation. You just feel like you're on top of the world, don't you? And, and then I say, this is as high as it gets. And then wait a minute, as you're sitting there looking out, you're like, wait, there's one peak higher. And that's Romans 9 through 11. You're not done yet. As good as Romans 8 is, you feel like he should go to application. He's going to take you just a little bit higher in chapters 9 through 11 where we see God's sovereign dealings with mankind. And he has chosen, it's his very glory, to give this salvation to whomever he, whomever he pleases or chooses. Even your faith is a gift from God. So he wants to keep climbing this ladder of soli deo gloria. And to get there, you need to start knowing God is the one who's going to dispense this salvation. He, he did it all. He accomplished it. And he gives it to whom he pleases. His plan and purpose for how he's working all things in Romans 9 through 11. The Jews and the Gentiles. The whole journey is so that he might show mercy to all. And he just journeys and shows you that I'm sovereign and I got a plan and I'm doing everything according to my purpose. And and Israel, their past, their present, their future, the Gentiles, for this purpose. I'm just a merciful God and I'm going to show mercy to both Jew and Gentiles. And now you sit in the right position before God. You sit amazed and you sit marveling. And I pray right now you're worshiping. Because now he's in in the rightful place, and you're in yours, and that's rightness with God. He's in the proper place, and you are in the proper place as giving him glory because he's the giver, and you're the receiver, and it will be that way forever. Are you in that place this morning? With this one cry, all glory to be to God alone. And in verse 36 of Romans 11 then, 
For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And I just want to make a couple observations about the structure of Romans, and then we're going to drill down to what I'm going to call the greatest verse in the Bible. That's it. That's bold. The greatest verse, I think, in the whole Bible. The high point. Romans 11, 33 through 36 teaches us much about the Christian life. First, guys, this is a journey in truth to get to this place. This is called doxology. This is called worship. And where Paul is right now worshiping, there's, there's a journey you've got to walk to get there. And it's called Romans 1 through 11. And you've got to journey. Uh, to, to be taken up with a life for the glory of God, you have to journey. You have to travel through the truth about God and his great salvation. Guys, you need doctrine and you need theology. You need Romans 1 through 11. You, you need to wrestle with these truths. Do you know how much Luther wrestled with these truths? When God was doing this to me, I can't begin to tell you how much I wrestled with these truths and had to go iron them out and fight and wrestle and weep in the secret place to understand them, to get them into my heart, to get to this place where Luther got to. You got to wrestle. You don't just wake up with it one day and say, I got it. Uh, from him, through him, and to him, that won't happen. You have to understand them. You gotta get epigenosis. You gotta get full knowledge to get these in your heart. You have to bring them into your life by faith. I've gotta study, look at them, learn them, and I gotta believe them. The church today has just skipped faith. And just here it is, just learn them and know them. No, you've gotta believe them. You've gotta look at them and get to the place where my faith is wrapped around these so I can say, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. Those two men I began this sermon with got this, to walk to a stake and be burned for the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you need to understand the four solas and, and let them sink into your mind and your heart and into your life, let them saturate. Luther said, if you get Romans, you get the whole Bible. If you get this, you'll get it all. That's why I want you to saturate in these. Our day and age doesn't like to meditate and think and wrestle, but you will never get to soli deo gloria without it. You won't. That is the only path that will bring you to doxology. You will never make God's glory. I, uh, this is side. Today, everything about churches is it's your singing. I, I, I join a church because of the singing, and I just want you to see that is wrong. The way you get there is through doctrine and truth and the word and you grow and you get to doxology to where no matter what you like here this morning, you just hit a key and everybody starts worshiping. You don't even care that I like hymns, I like choruses, I want an upbeat, low beat, I don't care. I just sang the, the Reformation song from my heart because of these solas. That's for free. <clears throat> you will never make God's glory your chief end without really getting Romans 1 through 11. I will die on that. You will never have that. You will keep making this all about you. Your glory will just keep rising up and your life will be given to your glory. And some of you got to do business with that right now is that if I had to define your life, it's about your glory. And that's, what, that's all this is. And I'll tell you right now, it's not, okay, I got to go worship harder. I got to have doxology, I've got to get these solas in my heart. I've got to get them to where I'm like Luther. I've been altogether born again when I realize I got the righteousness of God. This kind of heart worship can only come from the truth of God's word and his salvation. What else do I want you to see? I want you to see the morality of the Christian life the transformed life that God wants us to live in Romans 12 through 16 is to be a reflection. Is he, he wants you to go be a reflection of him in this world by your transformed life. And, and here's the key. God is so good. He doesn't just say, go live this way because I'm God. He could have done that because he is God. Here's what I want you to live. Go do it. I'm God. I'll throw you in hell if you don't. But instead, in Romans 12, 1, he says, Therefore, I urge you by the mercies of God to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. Because of Romans 1 through 11 and the solas, I want you to give yourself to me now as an act of worship. Soli Deo Gloria. Here's my life. It's a living sacrifice, God. It's yours. 
And I'm going to use it for one thing. If I had 100 lives, I'd spend them all for Jesus Christ. I'm going to use it for your glory and your glory alone. And I'm not going to take this flesh and spend all my days working for my glory. That's what happens when you get this. Seeing God rightly, putting him in the right place as supreme is the way that you get changed and transformed in the Christian life. Renewing your mind is seeing who God is for you in Jesus Christ. And as you do, you're going to be changed into these kind of people. And so our lives are the overflow of worship for who a saving God is. The transformed mind is taken up in God through his revelation of his character and his workings in salvation. You see this God for who he is? And you have doxology. You worship. It flows into a transformed life for his glory alone. Then in Romans 12, you serve the body of Christ. You know why you won't serve the body of Christ? Because you don't get the solas and you aren't worshiping God. And you're happy not serving the body of Christ. But when you get this, I got to serve the body of Christ. (laughs) He says you'll have a love without hypocrisy. You'll quit being fake. And this will be the most genuine thing about you. Because he first loved me, I love You'll one another each other. You'll submit to the government, your president, everything. Conscience issues, uh, waiting for his return, uh, missions in chapter 10, giving, all of these things. This is why I say this is the highest place. The banner over all the solas is soli deo gloria. And when you get this, You're going to say stuff like this if you'll look with me in verse 33 of chapter 11. When you finally get this, you'll say, oh, oh. Is that your response to the solas? Oh. How do you explain the unexplainable? How do you describe the indescribable? My affections respond to the gospel with, oh, oh. That is our response to the glorious things that God has done for us. Oh, the grace of our God. The depth of his riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. You know what he's saying there? He wants you to quit Telling him what's right and wrong, what he can't. You know how many times I hear when there's a calamity, what God can and can't do? He's saying, well, you quit. My judgments are unsearchable. My ways are unfathomable. If you're stunned by God, you should be. If you're stumped by your life, you should be. Quit questioning and telling him how to run your life and run his universe. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Are you God's counselor? <laughs> Little created thing, little anthropos saying to Theos, here's how you should do things. <laughs> Let me give you some counsel, God. Who has first given to him? Have you, have you done something so that he had to give you grace? The only thing you did to deserve grace was be a sinner. Who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And this is what we call a paradigm shift. And this is where uh, you go from an unbeliever where everything is from, through, and to you. And now in this salvation, you finally realize that everything is from God. So in these three little prepositions, this is all of life. Uh, if, if you took a circle, I've shown you this before when I was preaching through Romans, but there's a preposition called ek, and ek means to come out from. So everything is from him. So this is God. Everything comes from him. He's the source of all things. He speaks it into being. He's the source of salvation. He's from it. And then everything, dia, means through. And so everything now is through him. God is the agency of everything. Everything comes from God and everything is through God. He's the sustainer. He's the one who brings it all. And everything in the universe is coming from him, through him. And then ace means right unto him, right back into the middle And that's called the glory of God. And so everything in this universe, everything that's made or anything, it's all working to this one place. It's that his glory is supreme, that it's admired and it's worshiped and glorified. 1 Corinthians 15, 28, and when all things are subjected to him, 
then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, that God may be all and all, and we worship him forever. Since this is true, everything comes from God, everything is through God, and everything is to God, then all the glory belongs exclusively to God. It can't be some things are from God, okay? I just get that in your mind, your heart, your life. All things then point to God. So all the glory has to go to this one place where everything is from, through, and to. Everything gives him the glory. And that's where Paul just finishes, to him be the glory forever. And so I'm going to ask you a couple questions and we'll, we'll close. Who's to be glorified? Paul says, God alone, to him. God will not share his glory with another. You try to take it, and you're wondering why you got thrown on your nose. You don't take God's glory. You do not take glory from God. Not you, not a religious leader, not a church. No one takes glory from God. For my sake in Isaiah, God says, for my own sake, I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? Any contribution to our justification and you steal his glory. Have you added one stitch to your righteous garment of yourself? I want you to see you add one thing to this and you've stolen from the glory of God. I bring nothing. I don't add 1% to God be the glory for this. What does the glory do, God? Because I've gone and been long-winded, I had this beautiful word study on doxa, which means glory, and I traced it from the Old to the New Testament and what all of it means, and I am going to skip all of that because it's about eight minutes long. If you want to learn about it, I'd love to meet with you for coffee. Glory. Um, the glory of God, who gets the glory? It, it means for us to appraise God for who he is, to, to look and apprehend him as God, as from, through, and to all things. And so to give him glory is that everyone acknowledges that. We appraise it. We put him in the right place. We value him supreme. And so that, uh, just may everyone give glory to God. Who can glorify God? Well, only a believer who has traveled through the solas. As you, 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 you're going to glorify God by believing the gospel. It, it shows, uh, that this, I, I think this whole universe is God uh, created it to put on display to show all of his attributes. He never had to show mercy or grace to his son. And I think the whole universe was this plan to show all of his attributes, to manifest all of his glory. And when I believe his gospel... I put this saving God on display to the whole world. And as I'm transformed into his image, I put this uh, transforming God on display for all to see. So who can glorify God? Only believers. Unbelievers will glorify God by just showing forth his justice and his wrath. I'd much rather put on display his grace and his mercy to this world. And fourthly, how long shall we glorify God? And Paul says, pretty simply, forever. Forever. You know, that word is three words in the Greek. And it means into the ages. We are to glorify God for all the duration of time. It is into the ages. It never will end. It is, we are ever and always giving praise and honor to God forever. So guys, there will never be a time when you will quit giving glory to God. You'll never say, let's move on to something else. Is there something more? Is there something bigger? Uh, we will never exhaust the infinite greatness of our saving God, and it will go into the ages. I, I love this. You're going to glorify him forever. And when you've been there 10,000 years, you'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We're just going to worship him forever. This is the chief end of God, to glorify himself, and this is the chief end of man to glorify this God. And so my question to you is, what should our response be to this? 
Well, Paul kind of helped us out here, and our response should be very simple. Amen. Amen. Which means this is true. This is bedrock. This is the truth. And this is what I'm going to put my life to. Amen. To God be the glory forever. And I'll ask you this. Have you said amen to this? Every one of you need to now deal with yourself before God. All of these solas lead to the glory of God alone. And I'll ask you now, are you still wanting to add your little ditties to this gospel? Are you trying to clean yourself up so that you can rest in Christ? Are you still standing up and fighting the doctrine of election of a free grace that God can give to whom he chooses? Are you still wanting to counsel God about how to run your life and the world for that matter as you sit here this morning? Are you still seeking your own glory? Then you haven't said amen yet. And this demands a hearty amen. And I'll ask you then, have you said amen? Have you said amen that you are a a sinner by nature and you can't change your nature, you can't fix your your position, your, your standing in Adam? Have you said amen? Do you just think you're a little bit bad? I'm not as bad as the guy down the street. Or have you said amen? I am so bad and I have seen it and I can't fix it. I'm dead. There's no hope in me. Have you said amen to that? If you sit here still thinking you're good enough, you can still add a little bit, you can still clean up, you have not said amen to God. And have you said amen to but now, that God has sent his son to to live the perfect life and die the death that you deserved so that he can forgive you, cleanse you, wash you, and bring you into his presence? Wesley heard this and believed these things, and one day they're reading Luther's commentary, and he hears it, and he gets born again because it finally said, even my sins were forgiven. So it's not enough. Do you believe the doctrine of justification? I'm asking you to say amen, and amen means even my sins have been separated as far as the east is from the west and been pardoned. Too many people sit in the church trying to clean your life up, hoping one day that you can rest in that. You must say amen and you can't pass go until you do. Amen, even my sins. Can you say that this morning? Have you said that? My sins have been put on Christ and separated now. They're gone. I'll never bear them again. Have you said amen to that? Not just the doctrine Amen to me. I'm forgiven and cleansed and washed. Have you said amen to the solas of the Reformation? Have you said amen in your heart as you sit here this morning? To God be the glory forever. Amen. Then let's offer up our bodies a living sacrifice. May God's spirit blow through here this morning. And revive us again as we say amen to the solas of the Reformation. And we say amen to soli deo gloria. And the word soli again means alone. To where God alone gets all the glory for salvation. Amen? Amen. Please stand. Praise God from to you and so we join our hearts and we give praise to no man we give praise to the glory of God alone Lord I pray that every life would be devoted through this gospel to live for this glory alone and that we'll make any sacrifice necessary for your name to be adored and praised and worshipped 
as men, women, and children will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. God, we thank you now that we can celebrate together such an amazing reality of what you've done in history. And I pray just we thank you for our 19th anniversary, the way you've blessed this local assembly to hold to these truths and not let go of them. We thank you for it. God, we pray that we will never flinch on these truths, that we would die for them as the men we heard at the beginning of this sermon. Lord, that we would rather die than not preach Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I pray as we celebrate the Reformation. God, we are in need of another one in our land and in our world. And I pray, let it begin with us. Let it begin in our own hearts. God, to where each one of us say the amen. God, every heart here this morning, let them say amen to you through Jesus Christ. God, let us uh, recommit lives, hearts, futures, resources, prayers to this one thing of putting your name on display by the one who has given the Lord Jesus Christ as a savior. Lord, refresh us and renew us. Forgive us for how much we've made this about ourselves and our own plans and our own families and our own agendas. God, let everything that we do from being a dad and a mom to a little kid, God, let everything we do be for the glory of your great name. Lord, I pray now for our fellowship. I thank you for the food that you have provided, Lord. It's from you, uh, through you, and we pray that we would glorify you even in eating and drinking. I pray that we would glorify you now in our fellowship as one. Lord, we are one in Christ. Let this fellowship be deep and rich. Let no one be selfish, looking only to themselves. Let us just go celebrate and rejoice because we are the body of Christ. God, thank you for all the sweet hands that you've used in preparing and getting all this ready and those who helped set up and do chairs. We, we just, who have brought food, we are grateful for that. And so we just thank you, God, for what you have done in our midst. And we praise you. And it's in that sweet name of Christ that we pray. Amen.